but I'm, I'm going to talk about time and um, uh, I'm going to take you down a, a theoretical route and I'm going to make some um, examples that I th hope uh, would be uh, useful for you and uh, useful as a basis for, uh, for discussion. I have a uh, very uh, cheekily called this temporal relational governance. Uh, I thought it would be nice to add temporal in, 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 in front of, of relational and, and then actually see what, what comes out of it. Uh, the, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, owners of football clubs around Europe wanted to start a new league, the new a Super League. And uh, <clears throat> I think several of you have heard uh, about the, the story and, and, and probably followed it. What happened was that but football is basically a worker, uh, a worker sport. Uh, and uh, most clubs were actually founded as by local trade unions. It has, as you know, grown into a multi-billion euro business and uh, and investors have moved in. So is the case with Manchester United, they're owned by two American investors. Mm. Now, when they try to start this new league, which should be something above or beyond the Champions League, as we know it, uh, there were huge demonstrations and, and huge, very strong reactions. So the... Uh, this is a, a picture from last week where Manchester United fans actually uh, occupied uh, Old Trafford. And what is interesting about this is that the fans, uh, they, are, they, are, they are very much aware of the tradition. It comes from a uh, worker's background, I mean the sport, and they see it take, being taken over by big capital. Uh, so the, uh, this reaction or demonstration or has a, a temporal explanation to it. It's, it's a sort of a, an urge or a drive in many places in Europe to get back to, to take it out of the hands of, uh, of the investors and, and put football back in the, in the hands of the public uh, and of, of the fans and, and the families. Well, so the basic idea when I we bring time into it, and, and Ken said yesterday, well, in a process view, uh, actors are the processes that make them. Uh, to many people, this seems a bit strange, but it actually connects uh, not just to process, so-called process philosophy, but also to pragmatism, where as I speak momentarily, the way I speak, my gestures make me what I am right now. Uh, and that may, makes me acknowledge something about myself, my, my sort of temporary identity. If we add uh, a time view to that, we could say that actors are actually defined by their trajectories through time. And uh, just like the case of, uh, of football here, it is, I suppose, can be seen as a struggle of actors to reclaim their actorhood going a long way back into time. So it's a struggle between different trajectories. Uh, the international investors have their trajectories, the fans and the families and, and the friends have their own trajectories. And they, the trajectories of the fans uh, are fed by stories about going back more, sometimes up to a hundred years. So the underlying idea here is that to try and view actors as defined by the trajectories through time. And we spoke yesterday also about, about political parties and I think very much the same argument can be made about them. The, uh, so what is temporality? Well, there are many ways of representing time, but the idea of, uh, of temporal theory is that actors are always in the present. Uh, they never escape the present. 
and they're always suspended between a possible past and a possible <laughs> future. Now, some people say, what do you mean by a possible past? The past is what it is. Well, a tenet here is that actually the, the past is also available for redefinition, even re-exploring things in the past that have been suppressed or ignored, just as the future is a possibility. So this sort of turns things a bit upside down, but it sort of sees the past as a possibility uh, or a different past than what has been assumed. This is what makes, creates what we call agency of the processes of the present. Uh, people meet uh, during meetings, during demonstrations, during speeches. Uh, those are the processes of the present. And this is where past and future are enacted and where a different past and a different future might be enacted. And then we are back again to the processes that make actors. The processes are defined by what actors do together. So this is a relational part of it. What they do together in the present, uh, whether there are fights or discussions or, or whatever it is, the present, whatever it is, it can be seconds, it can be hours, could even be weeks or years at the most, but it's actually defined by, by what people do. So it's the relationality, the social relationality in the present that sort of uh, defines uh, past and future. And this is what is meant by the agency of the present. It's not the agency of the actors as entities. It is a temporal agency created by what they actually do together in the present. So, and I was just wondering, I've been looking at the other papers. Uh, and, well, this is not the paper, of course. This is Hofti 2011. I found this as kind of definition of, of governance as a category of social facts, process of interaction, decision making among the actors involved in a collective problem that lead to a creation, reinforcement, or reproduction of social norms and institutions. But the question is that. Are we just locating everything in one time at one time? So it's just one time following another point in time, following another point in time. So everything that actually happens revolves around that particular point in time. Or do we take a wider view of time? What happens to the, can, can we see, for example, a, uh, a governance processes as reaching back into the distant past? as we saw in the case with the, uh, with the Manchester United uh, fans. Uh, and yesterday we also discussed how leadership comes about. And I, think, uh, uh, and I think Eva brought that up in our group discussion about what defines leaders is, is that they may be able to look further into the future and, and gather support for that vision or picture of the, of the more distant future. So from yesterday's paper, Gareth uh, wrote that a normative investigation uh, and, and, and he, he focuses on the need to define a direction for transformative change. And direction is very important when you bring the time dimension into it. Uh, the direction in, because what direction are you actually talking about? Well, what we are talking about is actually a direction in time. So uh, the past is a sort of rudder and, 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 the, and, and the future is the bow. Uh, it's a direction in time where we come from and where we are going. So this is again, point, getting back to the, the present. This is what the Manchester United fans do, pointing out there is a past there is a past of, of European football that we will see pointing to a different future than what is actually happening right now. This brings up uh, some problems. Um, and this is where a process view, and I would call it a temporal process view becomes uh, quite handy. Uh, but where we need to take uh, uh, a stand on what we mean by change. And one of my favorites, uh, which I've talked about at various conferences and, and written about and continue to write about is the notion of continuity. 
uh, I think any anthropologist or student of social life will say that continuity is it. I mean, without continuity, there is nothing really. But continuity can be different things. Uh, but I also want to say that without continuity, and, and, and I teach managers, for example, and manager or students that go into management, consulting, etc. And we we emphasize the idea that without continuity, there is no meaningful change. But on the other hand, continuity also depends on change. So there is a there's a sort of call it uh, perhaps dialectical relationship between the two. But in the process view, we don't assume continuity. Uh, we assume change goes on, goes on all the time, but it's continuity, the, the, actually the exception to be explained. Uh, most conventional theory would say it's change is, needs to be ex, uh, explained. We turn it upside down and say, no, you actually need to explain how some forms of continuity emerge and, and, and prevail. So this is, uh, you could say, uh, uh, just to, to, uh, to illustrate schematically, uh, there are two forms of continuity here. And this is the traditional or transitional continuity, which, the, which is the classic. Uh, this is a conventional view and it requires no defense. It's, it's, it's uncontroversial. Uh, event period one leads to period two leads to period three is an evolution consolidation stabilization over time uh, and what happens then is that actors inscribe themselves into these historically conditioned transitions and this i think is how i read some of the papers for this workshop that this is how certain uh, structures or programs of governance become consolidated and stabilized, so that they grow in an evolutionary way over time. Now, the other form of continuity, which I spoke about, uh, and this is where the Manchester United story comes into it, is what I call provisionally uh, disruptive continuity. And it's a sort of term that easily gets you kicked out of journals uh, because they say, how the hell can that be? Well, it's disruptive in the sense that if you go back to our event period one, two, and at some point in time, some people, some actors may reach back to an event period X in the distant past that is say, well, what if we pay attention to that? What if we evoke that? What if we bring that into the present? How we then our future look? So what happens then is that what they do here, most people would say it's not continuity. Well, I would argue it's a new sense of refound continuity, as you can see. It is disruptive because it's a break with the evolutionary stream of one event to the next, but it's a disruption because it's a new sense of refound continuity. This is where agency lies. This is where transformative change often lies, right? This is how I would say that this is how change comes about by challenging continuity and installing a different sense of continuity. So this is how the challenge transitions by reaching back in time to the previous orders or movements or events. I am, um, and uh, I, I took this from Matt uh, also, uh, politics in the UK is steeped in tradition and many of its servants willingly defend archaic practices. So there are numerous psychological reasons for them to be doing so. So it can provide a sense of comfort while to others bring to elite institution. So this is this type of uh, transitional continuity that, that becomes, that's hard to get out. Of. We've done quite a bit of research on organizations and have actually sometimes shown how a different type of sense of continuity, reaching back and establishing a new refund continuity can actually bring about some, a different type of change. I have an example. Uh, I've written here about this in a couple of places, uh, which it caught my interest. I read a New York Times article a few years ago about the story of, of Lincoln's uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg speech. 
it's a fun story. Uh, it was introduced by the governor, I think, who took, who spoke for about an hour. And then Lincoln gave his speech and the, the entire speech is actually, it's, it took three, about three minutes, probably less. And it became one of the most important and maybe the most uh, important political spe speech in, in American political history. So this brings, again, I want to bring back this notion of the agency of the moment and how that ties together, creates a different sense of continuity over time uh, than what may be assumed. Uh, so it's actually about the becoming of the Gettysburg speech. That sounds strange. It, it was. No, it's still not finished, actually. If from a temporal view, te the Gettysburg address is not yet complete, and it probably will be. It is perpetually in the becoming. It is, as we say, and in, 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 one would say from a process view, it is an ongoing accomplishment. It is never really uh, finally ac accomplished. Um, so what was what is the story here? Well, the story is actually the battle between the Federates and Confederates uh, during the American Civil War took place in 1863. Uh, the, the Confederates suffered a defeat. Lincoln's speech uh, in 1863, I think, to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, to uh, because they were making a, a cemetery. Uh, so he gave a speech. This is extremely brief speech, uh, was on freedom and equality. Uh, for many years after that, people came, uh, men mostly, I suppose, came to commemorate the battle, dressing up like soldiers uh, and, and staged these sort of uh, fun battles. But what they celebrated was the victory of the North and the defeat of the South. However, uh, Lincoln's speech was on freedom and equality. Uh, and according to the story, uh, apparently some of the soldiers who fought there on the Northern side understood actually what they were fighting for. Uh, and a parallel stream of events took place throughout the 19th century, where the speech became interpreted as at uh, elementary schools and used by feminist movements, and where it was more or less understood uh, what, it, what actually Lincoln meant. The speech itself was forgotten and it was lost, uh, and it actually was retrieved in different versions, and it was brought into American uh, cultural life uh, and education. But it was sort of lying dormant for many, many years and it was misinterpreted or ignored by, uh, by certain streams of events, but other streams of events paid attention to what actually what, is, what, what was the meaning of it. So the hundred years after we have this famous, uh, I have a dream speech by, uh, by Martin Luther King, where he refers to to get the Gettysburg speech by Lincoln. Tor, yeah. we need to reach the end fairly soon. I just, we're yeah, yeah, I have two minutes. Okay. Yeah. okay. No problem. I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I will end soon. But there is a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's an, um, it's an example of how the, the, the original speech was actually became an echo in the moment of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream which was watched by many people and we know what happened to that. So it was a moment of redefining the battle for a different future 100 years later. So that was, uh, uh, you, you could say, uh, 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 a uh, an example of what I mean by sort of bringing back, creating a new sense of continuity. And this is what is enabled by a temporal view of things. So establishing a trajectory, it's about viewing history as a resource of forgotten or ignored events, rather than just assuming that if history simply lies there and cannot be changed. It's also about reconstructing a different and novel sense of continuity. And finally, to leverage 
uh, a selected past to actually see a different future. We're not talking about co copying it. We're not, we're not talking about nostalgia. We're talking about translation here. We're talking about seeing a different future, which is different from the past that is evoked, but seeing a different future through the selected past. So this is what makes it also a, a transformational uh, way to see things. So uh, anyway, uh, that's my last slide. And, and I know this piece of text was written by one of you guys, but I had forgotten whom. Uh, but I, I thought the idea that someone wrote that the atemporal uh, uh, and, and the atemporality and, and the, the overly structural emphasis um, may be not be optimal. And so what I've been talking about is a, a process view of time that might be a, an alternative way of thinking about it. <clears throat> 